Tonight we're glad to have with us uh, Crystal Yelker, who's working as part of the team of the uh, International Human Rights Program, which is a division of Homeland Ministries, which is part of the Disciples of Christ Church, which is headquartered in Indianapolis, Indiana. And Crystal is going to talk tonight about human rights in Paraguay, as he was a missionary for 24. I'm pleased that I got to see the Amnesty International slides tonight. I hadn't seen that presentation before, though I'd heard about it, and it's, uh, it's very nice and well done. And I uh, try to keep my contacts open with Amnesty International and uh, make some contribution to them from time to time and help, uh, help them and hope that They'll help me. He just pointed out to me that one of their publications has uh, something on Paraguay relating, I'm sure, to primarily to a conference that was held in December, conference on human rights, no less, in Paraguay, and that was relatively free in the sense that people who attended it were able to express their ideas and approve certain documents within some limits, I'm sure. Nevertheless, uh, certainly a good sign uh, in relation to a lot of other things that have been experienced in Paraguay. Um, however, the woman who is president of the, what do they call it, the Commission for the Defense of Human Rights in Paraguay, has since then been informed by the Paraguayan newspapers that she's going to be investigated for having interfered with the uh, function of the police. And it's anybody's guess what that really means. At the worst, I suppose it would lead to her being exiled from her own country. Uh, hope We can hope that it won't mean that and that uh, the situation, which is considerably better in Paraguay than it was at the time I was asked to leave two and a half years ago, uh, continues to improve. It's better, particularly in relation to political prisoners. Whereas in 76, uh, when the largest wave of repression took place, Anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 people were taken and held for varying periods of time as political prisoners. By the end of 79, the count of those who distinctly can be called uh, political prisoners was down to seven. Is that what that article says, or does it say nine? Or do you remember? Maybe it doesn't say. It does. Okay. I think two were released in December, and so I wasn't sure about that. Um, all such figures are, are relative and subject to uh, definitions, but um, that the situation has changed in relation to political prisoners, there's no doubt. And that it has changed because of pressures from around the world, letters from Amnesty International and letters and uh, teams who, who went to speak to officials and uh, bring the world opinion of the church to bear in as much as they could, um, have no doubt made a difference in Paraguay in that relationship. In some countries in the world, that's very possible and it does happen. Paraguay, of course, is a poor country, a small country, a rather dependent country upon larger powers, including not only North America, but neighboring Brazil, which is a whale of a power compared to Paraguay. Um, so they can't afford to get crosswise of too many people who are unhappy with the things they're doing. Um, 
of course, an organization like Amnesty International and groups, Christian groups who like uh, ones with, which, with whom I cooperated in my later years in the country, um, working in community development and, and the kind of work that we call popular education in South America, meaning education outside the formal school structures invariably get into trouble and uh, not only run the risk but are virtually assured of being accused of being communist groups, communist front groups. One of the things that really impressed our church executive secretaries from the states here when they went to Paraguay and uh, were interviewing various officials, I think it was the Minister of Exterior where they were presented with them. At any rate, in one of the ministries, they were presented with drawings by children, they say, uh, on behalf of Amnesty International to uh, uh, protesting imprisonments and tortures. And they were presented, shown these and as though it proved something and said, see, this is what Amnesty International does. You can see that it's a communist front organization. <laughs> well, they were totally unimpressed by that logic, but that's what you're up against, as I am sure what Amnesty International does uh, in uh, communist countries probably gets just exactly the opposite accusation. So. That's what you're up against, but it's, it's a wonderful thing that people around the world are concerning themselves about such things and really go to work to help our suffering fellow men. Um, there's another aspect of human rights. There are many other aspects, of course, but another area that I would prefer to talk more about tonight than the individual prisoner, the individual person who may be held without being accused of anything, be tortured to try to get him to confess things that he probably knows nothing about, or uh, that kind of thing. And that has to do with the social and economic structures in which our world functions and the uh, repercussions of the worldwide situation as well as that existing in each individual country upon the people as a whole, robbing them of the right to the basics of life, a decent opportunity to earn a living, decent place to live, the opportunity to make at least some decisions that affect their own life and they give them a feeling of being human beings because their decisions are of some significance in relation to their own life in contrast to being, feeling that they are things being manipulated always by somebody else, by those who are in power and those who control the money and the political power in any given situation. And I was I'm expected, I think, to focus particularly on Paraguay, and of course that's where my experience is by far the greatest. So um, let me do it by talking about a lemma is the only word that comes to mind, uh, slogan, a slogan that is uh, popular in Paraguay and that is emblazoned across the top of the bank building in the central plaza in downtown Asuncion in bright neon lines, uh, letters. It says, Paz, Trabajo y Progreso con Stroessner. Peace, Work, and Progress with Stroessner. It's an impressive sign in an impressive place. They keep it repaired most of the time. Uh, and you're supposed to be impressed by it. You're supposed to believe that it's true. Or at least pretend that you do to the extent of 
going to the polls every five years and voting again for Stroessner because obviously he is the one who assures this peace, work, and progress in the little country of Paraguay. At this safe distance, the Ames, Iowa, uh, maybe I can analyze what reaction that sign uh, stirs up in me and uh, say more about it than I ever would have in Paraguay unless I was very, very sure with whom I was talking. Um, I'd like to do it the, uh, from the back to the front, start with the progress. There has been some progress under President Stroessner, who's been in power since 54. Goodness knows he's had time enough to make some progress. Uh, there are some new schools, nowhere near the number he promised, but there are some. The roads are considerably better, though by far the majority of the roads are still dirt roads and difficult to traverse when it rains. Uh, the communication system is tremendously improved, especially the telephone system. It was really a disaster when my wife and I first got there. It was almost preferable to walk across town to try to make a telephone call. But um, in the last about eight years ago, a new system went in, which was really a tremendous improvement and it really reaches into the far parts of the little country and increases communication possibilities tremendously. One has to observe, however, that it went in with a huge bank of recording equipment like this I'm dealing with tonight at the central telephone headquarters so that any conversation anywhere can be recorded at any moment. And most of the people are quite aware that lots of conversations are recorded systematically, both systematically and spasmodically, so that um, it creates quite a means of check and control over the people of the country. And so uh, one wants to ask, for whom is all this progress? And as you check up on whom, who owns the new buildings, who controls the communication system, who has profited from the increased activity in commerce and in production, and notice how the wealthy are getting wealthier and the poor are quite consistently being, finding themselves poorer and with less opportunity year after year, you conclude that the progress is mostly for those who already have the wealth of the country. Um, you also conclude in the last five years that a lot of the progress is for the sake of Brazil. As um, the power, the economic power primarily of that nation sort of moves in on little Paraguay and takes it over bit by bit by investing, by buying up the land, by getting a super deal out of the Paraguayan authorities in relation to the construction of the big Itaipu Dam over on the Paraná. And you're very aware that the benefits to Paraguayans go mostly into the pockets of a very few people and that the Paraguayan economy as a whole is being sold out to someone else by various means. The peasants, the really poor and the marginal people who kind of operate outside the money economy of the country um, are left with very little opportunity and very little hope for the future as all the opportunities fall into the hands of someone else. And of course, at the very bottom of the heap are the Indians, like the Guayaquil that some of you have read about, and like the Paint de Vetera, with whom one of the teams with which I cooperated 
worked who are being squeezed off their land. Now, whether it's systematically and by intention and plan or not is a big, lovely academic debate in Paraguay. The fact is it's happening, whatever the reason. And so the Brazilians move into their territory because they want the hard woods out of their forests, and the Paraguayans move into it because they want to cultivate more land, clear the forest, and have more land to cultivate. And by whatever means, the Indians are losing their land to private ownerships, a concept which they don't share. They don't see any reason why land should be owned privately. And it's, it's a great shock and, and, in a sense, is the uh, final blow to the possibility of them continuing to live the culture and tradition that they want to continue to live. Not all of them will be exterminated, I presume, as the Guayaki and one or two others seem about to be, but certainly uh, the long-run picture is that none of them will be able to live in their traditional ways as they themselves would hope and want to. Well, then there's the work, and you have to say again, yes and no, maybe. They tell me that since I left Paraguay, the um, employment rate has gone up somewhat. There are jobs available now that there weren't for many years, primarily related in directly or indirectly to the construction of the huge dam. So that there's a certain kind of prosperity in this moment, and a lot of people in Paraguay are happy about it and are finally earning a salary, finally have something to do, and that's all to the good. But you have to analyze what that means in the longer run, too, I think, and you have to remember what it has meant for the last 15 years before that project started, when uh, the regime was bent on the concept that it had to industrialize. The only way to come into the modern world, according to the ideas that they have bought, is to industrialize. Well, now, how do you industrialize in a country whose resources are primarily agricultural and the hardwoods of the forest, uh, and that has a very small, really very tiny, internal market, its capacity to buy and consume industrial goods within the country is almost nothing. So uh, it, it's difficult to find any kind of industry that makes sense in that situation, especially when you add to that the fact that you're a thousand miles anyway to a seaport, and in that sense at a disadvantage with any to any other country. Uh, as far as getting something on the world market. Nevertheless, we have to industrialize, so after trying a few things and failing, we decide that electrical power is the thing, and we go all out to sign treaties with the neighboring countries to have more wealth and more capital to put into that um, to build dams and produce electric power, power that Paraguay will never be able to use in the foreseeable future, even their half of it and therefore will be selling again to Brazil, and in the case of the treaty with Brazil, at pre-established prices when the treaty was signed. So you, it's not hard to figure out who gets the major benefit. Um, also, you have to take into consideration the fact that this boom in work and this prosperity is related to a 10-year project. Now, given the way things operate in Latin America, it'll probably be 15 at least. But nevertheless, it's a limited time. When the construction of the dam is over, it's not going to take very many employees to run the generators. And so it's not a labor-intensive sort of thing. And uh, people who, have, who give up their little bit of farmland or something and move and take these jobs that are now available are going to come to the time when they're no longer available, 
and when very possibly it will be back where we were 10 years ago. So much for the work. How about the peace? The regime loves to talk about the peace that they have brought to the country. And to tell the truth, a great many of the people are very happy with the peace. And we've really had it, 30 years, almost an unprecedented thing in the little country of Paraguay. There have always been revolutions and coups and changes of one kind or another. And lo and behold, we've come upon a time when for 30 years you have the same government. It is peace, and as I say, quite a few Paraguayans are pleased to have that stability that, even though it's heavy-handed, that situation is not changing. They seem to remember the last uh, violent revolution, the one in 46 and 47, with great horror. That was before I got there. Uh, but the memory of it in the Paraguayans who are old enough to remember it is that they never want to repeat something like that. So they're willing to pay a pretty heavy price to have stability and peace. Not everyone agrees, however, that all this peace is an unmixed blessing. As much as seven years ago, a poem was circulated around the country, and many people had a good deal of satisfaction in reading it in private circles. And I don't have the whole poem with me. It's one of my frustrations that I seem to have lost my original copy. It's in Spanish, of course, anyhow. But it runs, a part of it runs like this. How much peace can be endured? We have seen peace decreed, imposed, and enforced. It surrounds us, it immobilizes us, and it renders us all useless. We have lived peace, had peace for breakfast, peace for noon and at night, so much peace that it's hard to swallow anymore, and we want to vomit it back. We have endured peace, oh, how we have endured peace peace in which to be terrorized out of our very humanity, and peace in which we can die of malnutrition. President Stroessner is quite often rather free in stating why um, a heavy price has to be paid for peace. And he justifies many of the heavy-handed things that he does on that basis. He says, it just has to be done. That's the price you pay for peace, as though that took care of the problem. And if you can get him to go ahead, go ahead and explain what some of the prices are, or if you confront him with uh, these costs to the people, um, he sometimes will quite frankly say, yes, that's the price we're paying, and it's worth it. What are some of those things? Um, go out to Pastoreo and sit in the farmhouse across the uh, road where farmhouses lie on one side of the road, and on the other side, there's a big open pasture land. And you notice that, behold, the pasture land is being plowed up. And so you ask the farmer with whom you're sitting, what's happening out there? Uh, General so-and-so is planting soybeans. And then he begins to tell a very sad story. This little community has maintained that open part out there, the pasture land, as a communal uh, holding among us where we could graze our cattle, where we could have a few milk cows so that our children can have milk. 
And it's easy to see why that was necessary. The little land that he actually owns behind his house is so small that it's scarcely enough to raise corn and mandioca for the family. And so the community's opportunity to have any milk and occasional meat depended on that pasture land. But last year, the government authorities came and said that since that land was not being used productively, it would be sold to General so-and-so. And it was duly sold, and it is now producing soybeans for the general. This is the kind of price Stroessner pays to keep the peace because, of course, all the other generals would like to trade places with him and be at the top. And so he buys them off by making it possible for them to acquire more and more land, by uh, assigning to each one of them a section of the border with neighboring Brazil and Argentina, um, to, struggle to control smuggling activity. Almost all Paraguayans will tell you that Paraguay's principal industry is smuggling. Uh, that's not because the internal market for smuggled goods in Paraguay is that great. That's because you can smuggle them through Paraguay into the other countries, including the United States in the case of drugs, uh, and turn a quick and large profit. So um, smuggling is against the law in the sense that at least in Paraguay you're supposed to pay duty on the things that come in. But in order to keep the generals happy, these enforcers of the law, uh, you assign each of them a section of the border so that he can control the smuggling in that area and line his pockets. That keeps him happy so that he'll keep uh, supporting the regime as it is constituted. <coughs> um, the whole system, the whole regime is full of that kind of corruption to the point where corruption itself seems to be one of the reasons why the regime doesn't fall. For years we said it's going to fall of its own corruption. Finally we were convinced that there are so many cor people corrupted by the regime that everybody feels that they have something to lose if they tell on anybody else or if anything gets changed. And so everybody's willing to, uh, out of whatever small interest they may have in it, uh, they will stand up for the regime and protect it to keep it in power, lest they lose some small benefit. It's also done at the price of virtual, virtually prohibiting cooperation or community organization of any kind. Now the organization of the Colorado Party, the political party in power, of course is promoted in every community all over the nation. But if anyone other than that gets together to talk about their problems, to org form a community organization of any kind in an effort to deal with any kind of a problem, you're very apt to be in trouble soon, especially if there's an aspect of cooperation about it. Let me tell another incident that I observed from a distance. I really wasn't a part of it, but I was close enough and heard daily reports on it enough that um, it, it really was a traumatic experience for me. During two and a half years, excuse me, we have watched a community of peasant farmers who had left their old residences, mostly in the rural area, also in the southern part of Paraguay, go up into uh, uh, the north where new lands were be op being opened and with machetes and hoes, no bulldozers, dig out the forest and begin to occupy a new land and plant crops. And they had done it in a, uh, committed as a committed community, working together, 
deliberately planning that they would buy their seeds together, buy their fertilizer together, market together, because that's the only way you can have a wee bit of control over the price you get for your products. Um, that they would have certain cooperative efforts in the way of consumer goods so that they could buy a big sack of flour for the community instead of uh, uh, buying it by the handful in a small paper bag at the local store and paying twice the price for it. All that sort of thing uh, was part of their plan to see if they couldn't get ahead, desperately poor people. They had done it at great risk because they had to agree to buy that land, not a terribly high price, but they had to pay for it because it was land that al was already in private ownership. Uh, they were able to get help from outside the country to make the initial payments. And they were beginning to make a go of it, and they were beginning to make their necessary payments so that that land would eventually be theirs and so forth. On an early February morning, three truckloads of the army come in before daybreak with guns firing mostly in the air to frighten people. Nevertheless, to round up all the inhabitants of the community, women and children included, put them in those trucks and take them first to the local military establishment the next day on into the city of Asuncion and the main prison there for investigation. And then it's published in the paper that a communist cell has been discovered in the northern part of Paraguay and has been crushed. It was the most dramatic of such stories in my experience, but only one of many. And the experience of our, um, our own teams that tried to work in rural areas and also among the poor in the outskirts of Asuncion was that uh, the fact that we insisted that the projects we sponsored be the community's projects in which they were involved in the planning, they had the satisfaction of feeling responsible for making it theirs, and if there was some success, something achieved, build up their own assurance, their own self-esteem so that they would be better prepared to face life in the next round. This was our, uh, our ideal, our way of working. But the fact that it required bringing people together for conversation, easier for you to do it, I think. The fact that it required bringing people together for conversation, some small sort of organization and dividing up of responsibilities was always suspect, and so you had to Your problem was to walk a line so that in such a way that you kept <laughs> uh, the authorities informed of what you were doing sufficiently that you are above suspicion of subversive plotting and planning, and not so well informed that they can move in on you and uh, manipulate your projects to their own ends. In other words, make it appear that it's the work of the Colorado Party and the, and the regime that to help the people, and therefore, and also channel whatever gain there is to the support of those in the regime, which of course defeated all your purpose in the in the kind of work we wanted to do uh, because it took from the people satisfaction of it being their project. And this is undoubtedly the reason why a number of the team members were eventually taken prisoner, taken for questioning. You're never taken for a stated charge. You're taken in for questioning in Paraguay. And you may be held for years and years, but it's still just questioning as far as any of the information you can get out of the authorities about it. Um, so this, uh, 
was what we were up against. And when there was a little incident, no real threat to the regime, I'm convinced, uh, and nothing that we had any direct relationship to, the authorities used it as an excuse, excuse to round up uh, persons whom they wanted to question, and we were among those persons. I only suffered the invitation to leave the country, an arrangement to, for my executive secretaries to get me out of the country if I would be released immediately. Others had to spend considerable time in prison. But wonder of wonders and joy of joys, the majority of those team members who have come out of prison have gone back to work in the same kinds of things on the same teams, running the same risks all over again and walking that same delicate line uh, with certain assurances from the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Education, but never knowing at what moment uh, the Department of Investigations may decide that despite those assurances, these people ought to be questioned again. So Stroessner's regime really has been a peacemaker, uh, but we always like to ask at what cost and is it really worth it to fight so hard for the national security of the state when everything else seems to be given up? And then the other surprise, since 1970, since 1969 really in the case of Paraguay, is that the church of all things has become the troublemaker, the principal tr troublemaker. It's some of those silly Christians, more Roman Catholic than Protestant, but a few of each, who insist that people should be treated as people and who say to the regime, it's not right to deal with people as you do and to take away from them all their opportunities. This is, some, this is rather new in Latin America. Uh, altogether too often in the past, the church and the regimes in power walked hand in hand. Uh, but in recent years, in many of the countries, and certainly Paraguay is one of them, the church has taken a new stand. The regime has not quite known how to deal with that. They can put down almost any other entity without much fear, but the church in the end has a loyalty of enough of the people that it's pretty hard to attack it straight on. So they have become more repressive. They don't know how else to deal with it, so they just are more repressive. Also, they look for opportunities to divide the church, and so they support the reactionaries, the ones that don't, don't go along with the new social concerns, and give them uh, aid in order to divide the ranks in the church, and that, of course, with some success. It's always easy to do that kind of thing. Nevertheless, the church, it seems to me, continues to be the one institution in the situation that maintains a little space wherein people can be human beings, where they can come and express themselves. Uh, not always with all freedom, but at least with more than any place else in society, and uh, where leadership can develop and continue to exist. A situation like this destroys leadership, of course. If you're not part of the regime and you really are capable and have ideas, you're a threat to the regime. So you either are moved out for political reasons or because you are ambitious you go somewhere else where you can have a better life of it because you are capable and you can do better if you just have the opportunity. And so the best leaders of the country are drained out very rapidly in such a situation. The only place where I see leadership continuing is among those who stay because they're dedicated to the idea that somebody has to be the voice of the poor of the people who don't ha otherwise have a voice. And that's sort of been the motto of the Roman Catholic Church since Medellin. Uh, the church's role is to be the voice of those who otherwise have no voice. 
That's my analysis. Uh, there's lots more that could be told, of course, but uh, if you have some comments or some questions, I'd rather deal with them. Yes, ma'am. Yes, and there, there are a few of them. Uh, there, well, there's no, there is none now on the scale I described in that community. And it was only commune in a, in a semi-sense. They farmed some land by working it together, but each family had its own land also. And they didn't live together. They had separate homes, but they lived in an, in an area. That was our basic concept, help people form cooperatives. And according to the laws of the country, cooperatives are permissible. There are laws that regulate cooperatives in the country, but try to form one. You're just amazed at the stumbling blocks that, that are thrown in your way to forming one. Mm, one of the principal ones. <laughs> yes. Disciples of Christ is a Protestant group. Um, and primarily the Roman Catholic Church because, of course, that's the dominant one and that's the one that has strength. The, the disciples scarcely fill the lower end of a thimble uh, as far as numerical strength is concerned. Uh, uh, there are two or three other Protestant groups that are a little bit stronger numerically. But they're not main what we, I don't know whether I should use that term at all or not. I was going to say what we would call mainline Protestant <laughs> groups. That's probably a very bad term. That will get me into trouble. But anyway, there, there aren't Methodists and Presbyterians in Paraguay. There are only Pentecostal groups and Southern Baptists and a very em evangelical branch of the Anglican Church. Um, and so the disciples are the group. Uh, that has been most open to cooperation with Roman Catholics since the Rom Roman Catholics have been open to that co cooperation. And uh, it's been my privilege to be part of that getting together finally in a Latin American country. I don't know whether it will make much difference. Um, I'm inclined to think uh, just what the Pope said in Mexico is not going to influence it that much. Um, the reaction, the reactionary elements that have already been created in Latin America against it within the church have affected already. There isn't any doubt about it. The Catholic Church is deeply divided, uh, not to the extent of being two churches, but there certainly is an agreement among Catholics. Nevertheless, and, and those who are on the progressive side are disappointed with the, what the Pope said and did. They don't seem to feel that he completely undercut them, but uh, they're disappointed in that he didn't take a stronger stand. Uh, I don't think it probably is, carries the importance of uh, really stopping the progressive movement. Yes. Um, I can't answer with any certainty just what the status of the Guayaquil is. Uh, as much as three and four years ago, there were very few Guayaquil left. That may mean that there are now none 
except those who have been absorbed into other communities some way. But I'm not sure about it. I just, uh, that's one area in which my current information doesn't tell me a thing. There are some other of the smaller tribes that are in danger of the same thing happening, undoubtedly. The Paita Vetera, which is the group with which our team worked, are a large enough group that they're not under any immediate threat of extinction. And there are several groups still in within the borders of Paraguay who are in that position. But I have to say immediate because the tendency always, whether it's intentional or planned or not, is to crowd them out. Uh, well, I recently read an uh, analysis of a similar situation in Nicaragua, which I think expresses it beautifully. It says that I think it's the Mosquito Indians of Nicaragua have been zoned out of existence by the government having declared that the land they occupy will henceforth be dedicated to industrial purposes instead of agricultural purpose purposes. There have been some sporadic outcries about it and publication about it. I am not aware that there is a constant pressure on the Paraguayan government about that matter. Now, there may be more than Irish, but I'm not aware of it, clearly. Now, European groups have responded generously to the idea of funding legal protection and money to buy in order to assure lands for certain tribes. And this was one aspect of our Paite Vetera project, that lands were being secured for them. Now, it, if, even if it's completely successful, and it's by no means finished yet, though some lands have been secured, um, even if they uh, succeed in the best sense that's imaginable, it still doesn't mean that the Indians can live in their semi-nomadic way of life. They're still going to be restricted and will have to come to sedentary farming. Is that the right word? Uh, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> um, the, because they're, they're just, it's impossible now to get enough land, to reserve enough land for them that they can live in their traditional way, which also was agriculture, but it was slash and burn agriculture. You, you live and work the land for two or three years and then you go somewhere else and let the forest grow back over that. So uh, there are, there's more than one project like that in the country, nowhere near enough to take care of the various tribes that need that kind of help, but there are several efforts to establish legal control over the land for the Indians. And that brings up a curious thing too in the way law gets manipulated. The first place, Paraguayan law uh, has all sorts of relationships to Europe, but absolutely none to the Indians of Paraguay. And so it provides for private ownership, but uh, not for tribal ownership. And so it has been contended by Paraguayan authorities and, and enforced that it is impossible for a tribe to be the owner of land. And so these projects can't even, if they buy the land, can't give the title to the tribe. They have to give it to some other institution that has what's personaria juridica, um, power of attorney, I guess, literally, uh, that has legal standing, that's the way to say it, that has legal standing in the country. It has to hold that title for the tribe. The tribe is not a legal entity, so it can't hold the title to its land which is really sad. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
Young people are less apt to accept it. There are those who do, but they, the people who are willing to take risks that might upset the boat, that might cause problems, tend to be the younger people. And there are many of them. Of course, like most third world nations, it's a nation with a high percentage of young people. Um, those who will really take a strong stand and go out and work and take risks and make sacrifices no matter what are a tiny minority, of course. But I suspect that the majority of the young people, even up to 30 years, in their own thinking and in their private groups, maintain a, an attitude that would make them cooperate with any realistic change. They're afraid to stick their necks out and be the first, but they uh, cherish the idea that there could be a change and that they would want a change. I really think that's true. About um, uh, how uh, the government uh, can maintain the um, I mean, I'm from Chile, and uh, I know the situation in uh, Paraguay is the same in uh, um. Chile, Argentina, and Brazil. Yes, that's very obvious. Uh, that's the, the impossible question to answer. Um, I, I don't know. I better not even try to answer. I don't know how it can change. Um, it will change in all probability in places like Chile and Argentina before it will in Paraguay. And it'll change in Paraguay as an aftermath to the change in, in nations where the people have experienced more democracy and have, uh, uh, have had more of a middle class and more opportunity in years past, even though they don't have it right now. Also, just for the fact that they're larger nations and more, more strength in every sense than little Paraguay. Um, I don't think the stand of the church will bring about the change. I think the stand of the church is very important to retain some leadership and some space in which to move and breathe and retain some humanity, but it can't bring the change. Uh, I'm almost certain after Chile's experience, that the change will have to come by violence. Any substantial change will have to come by violence. That's not possible in the present situation, but at some point in the future, it will probably be possible, possible again, and it will probably happen. And better than that, I, I can't answer. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Depends on how you do define communism, of course. If, if buying your flour in one sack makes you a communist, <coughs> why, sure, you are, <laughs> that is. <laughs> but uh, no, if you, as I suppose, if you're thinking, in, 
in, re in relationship to, uh, to Moscow or to even Havana, that there's any direct relationship to the intentions of that group, none whatsoever. Nevertheless, that's the assumption the regime makes and seems to believe. I don't know whether they really believe it or whether they just tell it that way because that justifies the stands they take. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And it's the same mentality. It's the same mentality. You see, um, in order to justify a state in which the state becomes all supreme in order to maintain national security, there has to be an enemy that you're fighting off. And that has been defined as communism. And if, if you can't find any real communists, you imagine that there are some so that you can justify that concept that you're fighting for your national security. Uh, and it grew, in Paraguay at least, and I'm sure it's not the only place where it happened that way, it grew right along with anti-communism in the United States when in the days when our State Department offered lots of military help to whatever country was fighting communism. All you had to do was say you were fighting communism and you got help from North America. And so, of course, that's what we said to get it. 